You always have to have the downtime. People don't realize the whole aspect of creating the physique happens a lot after the workout. So it's allowing your body to you know, recover. In a workout, you're breaking down all the muscle fibers. They need that time to repair. So if you're going full throttle all the time, your body never has that time to rest, recover, and do what it needs to in order to repair. Imagine you've had 16 surgeries and countless more body injuries. How do you think you would feel getting out of bed every morning? If you were a normal person, you might just want to stay in bed and not do anything. However, if you had the mindset of Whitney Jones, not only would you want to get out of bed, you'd want to accomplish amazing things every day. This is exactly what Whitney does, and it's based first on her mindset. When you approach every challenge that you face with the mindset that you can overcome it and become unstoppable, you will find the strength within you to do what others call impossible. Whitney has been doing this for years as a professional bodybuilder, as a single mom with two amazing boys, as the owner of the largest personal training gym in the state of Arizona, plus much more that you'll hear about in this podcast. When you're faced with a challenge, whether it's physical, mental, or financial, this podcast will help answer some of those questions for you, such as what can you do when you're faced with a severe physical injury? How do you train so that you heal super fast? How do you develop an unstoppable mindset? You're gonna hear about all of those, plus, what do you do if you're a bodybuilder competing in Mr. Olympia and Arnold Classic Fitness International events and you break your neck? Yeah, you break your neck. You're going to hear not only how she came back from that injury, but how she became the first place winner in Mr. Olympia two years in a row. Plus, Whitney is a speaker, a podcaster, and a fitness guru. Get set to put on some mental muscle that'll make you unstoppable. Whitney, thank you for being on the show today. It's so awesome to have you here. You are one of the fittest girls I've ever met in my life. <laughs> You're awesome. And today is the day after Mother's Day, so happy Mother's Day to you. And most people would not thank guess you. that you have how many children? Two. Two amazing boys. They are 15 and 12, so they are busy. But, you know, I wouldn't have it any other way. I love it. That is so awesome. Yeah. And yeah. so excited to be here on the podcast with you guys. So thanks. I'm honored to be invited, and we're going to have some fun. I know that. Yes, yes, we sure are. Yep. So I think the biggest thing that our listener can get from you is – you are in amazing shape, right? You're in amazing physical condition. You look amazing. And you also have a ma amazing physical function, right? You have a lot of capabilities, strength, endurance, um, agility, quickness, be all kinds of stuff that it requires to be any type of athlete that <laughs> anyone would want to be. So that is awesome. You're a how many time Olympian? I'm a two time fitness Olympian. Two time fitness Olympian. But yes. they would never guess that you've had 16 serious injuries, right? Yes. Well, 16 surgeries and a lot more serious injuries. But it just wow. came to 16 surgeries. So, yeah, I don't even know how many injuries total. Honestly, it's pretty sad, but I kind of stopped counting because what does it matter now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, that's what everyone is on a quest for is how can I be the fittest version of myself? And, sure. you know. One guy might want to be really fit because he wants to be a better golfer and have a strong golf swing and have energy to play with his grandkids. Another girl might want to have um, some specific fitness goals, running a marathon or triathlon or, you know, to have keep up with her kids or, or spouse mm -hmm. and go on trip. Everyone has a different goal. 
but everybody is all and they take fitness actions but everyone is plagued with this thing we call injury and and beyond just the normal exercise pain so right. the goal of today's show is really to figure out how can you get the most amazing results from fitness and then weed out the negative results because that's one big thing that like we talk about is 87% of people who exercise get injured from exercise at some point. Yep. And so how, how do you become part of that 13%, right? So mm -hmm. first let's talk about, you know, one of the first great questions I like to ask fit, very fit people like yourself is today it's uh, it's 9, 18 AM. What have you ate so far today? <laughs> Well, um, that's a great question because nutrition is crucial, but what's more important is learning what works for you. So through the years, there's a lot of things that I've learned through trial and error and finding out what foods work best for my body, which ones fuel me, keep me feeling full. So you do have to take the time. You know, a cookie cutter diet does not work for everybody. Uh, this morning, I had uh, one whole egg, four egg whites, I had a bowl of oatmeal and then sugar works great for me. So I actually had some fruity pebbles as well. So that's what I've learned through the years. Um, obviously doing some dieting consistently for years and years early in my fitness career helped me get a great foundation. But then we all love fun foods. You know, you think about the foods you crave, what do you want? So you've got to be able to get your body into a good position where then you can have those treats. And it's a lifestyle, not a diet. So I've been able to, of course, with consistent nutrition, been able to get my body in an amazing spot so that I can have treats. And it's stuff I love that works, fuels my body. And that's where I start. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. So there's probably a reason why, well, what, what time did you have that meal? So I got up at six o'clock. I did some fasted cardio, just kind of get my heart moving, heart pumping. Yeah then of course, that's a great way. We all need that time to have some meditation and, and just get our bodies in that right mindset for a good start of the week, start of the day. So then I ate at 730 and then I will eat, I eat every three hours. So another meal will be coming. There's a couple of things that came up there. One is I'm guessing you had those sugars for a reason. You didn't just have them because they taste good to you. It's because of some <laughs> workout that's coming in your day and you yes. want to be fueled for that workout. Am I correct? You always want to be fueled for workouts. That's yeah. what makes it an exciting and very effective workout. So yes, to answer your question, I try to allow myself to have good nutrition, obviously having good nutrient dense foods, but then the sugar helps me personally to be more like energetic, explosive for the type of workouts that I do. For you, the listener, three different types of energy pathways. One is that we're all right now on during the podcast and that's aerobic energy so long story short we're using oxygen and fats primarily for fuel then you start to get into uh exercise and as you get more intense and as you get around two minutes or less that you can't do the activity past two minutes so intense exercise right you use glucose <clears throat> primarily so what whitney's saying is that when you do exercise that you can't do for more than two minutes you rely on glu glucose and therefore fruity pebbles has glucose in it or sugars which then turn into glucose in your body and that's what you need for that type of workout so if you're trying to do something like a ketogenic diet which is all the craze these days and you're mm -hmm. not having enough glucose well where is your muscles and where's your body that's been built for thousands of years to run on glucose in that energy zone how are you going to be at your best and the answer is you're not right would you agree with that Whitney Absolutely agree. It, I mean, there's so many bad diets that come throughout the years, but literally I always say, you got to think what works back to basics is always the way, but you know, sometimes it's hard to not be tempted by the get quick, like results and people jump on that marketing and advertising does a great job of really pulling people in, but you got to go back to the basics. And for me, I absolutely agree. Um, I'm not a fan of those types approaches, not to say they're wrong. There are some benefits for specific types of people, but for majority general population, not the best route. Yeah. Well, and let so, me interject as the outsider to this fitness world uh, that yeah. both of you are involved <laughs> in, because you mentioned you got up at six this morning and uh -huh. then you didn't eat till seven 30. So you had a 90 minute 
break there from what most ordinary people do is once they get up, they eat breakfast. So what is the reason that, that our listeners should be doing that? You said first you got your body going, then you got your mindset going, and then you ate. So why is that important, that timing? Joel, that's a great question because the timing of nutrition is, is absolutely crucial to getting you the results you want. Now, I actually get up, I do some stretching just because, again, some of the injuries that I have require me to properly stretch, warm my body up before I go into any type of activity. So I spend time doing that. And I actually do a lot of my meditation and mindset before I start my exercise. Then I did um, 30, I, today I did actually 35 minutes of just some more steady state, not a high intensity interval circuit or anything. It was mediocre steady state. So a little higher than just like, it wasn't a walk, but getting my heart rate going, um, kind of doing a little bit of um, every so often, I just kind of do sprint for 30 seconds, just to really elevate my heart rate, bring it back down. So I ate within 30 minutes post training. And that's where it's important, you know, being able to get the nutrition and you can't go an hour to two hours afterwards, because at that point, your body needs energy and it's attacking the muscles and your body. And that's what you don't want. So if you're doing any type of activity, you need to really be careful about not going too long post-workout, post-cardio before you get some nutrition introduced into your body. Yeah. So, you know, that's interesting, Whitney, because in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of uh, research to come out. And I'm not saying that the research is true. In fact, I think the research is, is, is at least the direction of what they're trying to say is not true. And that's that fasted cardio doesn't give a better result than the non fasted cardio, right? Have you seen, mm -hmm. have you right. seen some of that, but you know, I what's have, yep. <laughs> but what's interesting <laughs> for you, the listener is I promise you that after having done and being around and in the bodybuilding world for over 20 years now, every person who looks like Whitney, 99 or 98% of them are following that as one of their protocols. So mm -hmm. there's the evidence. You don't, you don't need to read some skinny, nerdy, double PhD doctorate that's trying to prove in a lab that that doesn't work. Just look at the result and you'll see that in fact, it absolutely does work and it is a method. So Whitney, I mean, I'm sure you've had client because you've trained so many people to get in the best condition of their life. And you've seen the difference between not doing that and doing that. And what kind of result mm -hmm. do you see in your own research? Well, what I've found too, is for a lot of the clients, you know, if they have, especially women, I deal with primarily women, um, when it comes to those who compete, I do train men for lifestyle, but for what I see, if you have say hormonal imbalances, um, specifically thyroid issues, those type clients are better off not trying to stress their body early in the morning and doing fasted cardio. But for other people who just are normal living and they're not having a lot of issues, fasted cardio is a great way, even, even for people who just get out and walk for 20 minutes. And it's not intense, but that helps get the blood flowing, gets the endorphins flowing, allows them to kind of start their day on the right foot so that they can have a very productive day, wakes them up. So outside of the, you know, physique and, and getting your body to a specific version, best version of yourself, I think there's a lot of benefits for it, doing fasted cardio, even if it's very mediocre and in very steady state, unless you have some of those hormonal issues, because the last thing you want is to really stress and tap your body too, too much. Now I do it personally, um, I have some heart issues, so I actually do fasted cardio because my heart is slow. And in the mornings when I wake up, it's really difficult if I don't do that to kind of get my heart moving and pumping the way it should. So this is something actually through some of my doctors that they have recommended as well. So you have some issues with what we call bradycardia or slow, slow heart rate, correct? Well, it's, it's a hybrid form of tachybrady. So it okay. actually goes both ways. And okay. then I have a second degree block in my AV node where the the heartbeat is irregular and it goes for long periods of time where it will beep, beep, uh, and then beep, 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 beep. So, you know, there are issues there, but again, it's been something I've dealt with for 10 years now. And 
um, trying to avoid another heart surgery. <laughs> um, but eventually I do know I will have to have a pacemaker, which is fine. I'll bling it out. I'll make it look pretty. <laughs> well, make the best of it. <laughs> well, Whitney, you're a walking perfect example of a shirt that Joel wears to workouts often. And what that <laughs> shirt says is no excuses. And so exactly. if you, the listener, think you have an excuse because you're 40, 50 pounds overweight, well, you probably don't have the heart condition that Whitney just said. And you probably haven't been faced with all these injuries and you haven't had many of these issues. And you might not have two kids that you're also taking care of in a 17 plus trainer gym that you're running and hundreds of clients. and she still makes it happen. So Whitney, like awesome kudos to you for, for not only being in shape, but being in one of the most fit people in the world and having all those challenges. So no excuses. That's true, right? We have one life to live. So you got to make the best of it. Yeah, well, I think the most important things you just said is it's really your mindset and that you can make excuses. And that's what unfortunately a lot of people do. You know, I don't have the time. You know, my body just isn't made this way, or I never was able to do this in the past. Uh, but that can all change if you alter your mindset. And having worked with Whitney this past year on her speaking skills and watching how she approached that, the same as she's done in her fitness area. You know, she develops a system. And she's been doing lots of podcasts, sharing these words of wisdom and making it so easy to understand. And I think that's, that's what's so good about what you're doing, Whitney, is the level that you're at, very few people will ever get to, to compete right. at the level that you get to. And that's not who this podcast is designed for, but you're an right. example of how we can use that mindset to get ordinary people to that extraordinary level. So congratulations Absolutely. on doing that. All right, Robbie, well, let's you. go to the next subject. Whitney, first question in terms of developing your body and getting your body into elite physical condition. And really, let's center this around how others could also create a similar type of result and get in amazing shape. So what was it like at the start of your journey with fitness? What did you want to achieve? And what did you do to make some real breakthroughs? Well, growing up as an athlete all my life with two older brothers, I was always trying everything. So that was always fun. I've, I've loved being active. And so as an adult, my friends and I wanted to get in the best shape of our lives. So we said, let's train for triathlons, marathons, and, and see where it, it takes us. So enjoyed that for a little bit. But the idea was to really get in the best shape of our lives. But for what I found, I wanted a tight toned physique. And the endurance events was just kind of making me, for lack of a better word, skinny fat. And there was no muscle, muscle development, which is what I was shooting for in my ideal physique. So I decided to get it back into lifting. I had done it at a very you know, basic level, not having any knowledge, but wanted to learn more. So I got my certification to become a trainer just from my own personal knowledge and then started really lifting and enjoyed the process. That's where I discovered competing. And, you know, again, we always want that challenge that really lights our fire every day. What is it that motivates you to get in the gym or, or you know, whether it's physical fitness or whatever the goal is, there needs to be something that can motivate you that really ignites that passion each day. So I discovered fitness and fitness competitions and truthfully, the goal was to just go out there, have fun, and see what happens with my body, learn the science behind being able to create and sculpt a physique from something that I was hoping and admired to be, but was curious if it was even possible, and then understanding more about my body. You know, again, we go to college to become an expert in a specific field. To me, the idea was let's learn everything I can about my own body to get it at the level that I love because it's information that I can always use. And I encourage everybody to try to take those steps to learn more about their bodies. But this was a fun way to do it. It was an opportunity to go, okay, let's go out. Let's set a goal of getting on stage and doing a fitness competition and see if I like it. And then from there, you know, decide what is my next adventure? Well, I loved it. I was hooked, but my expectations were never 
I want to be the best in the world. I want to be an Olympian athlete, I, even to be a pro athlete. It was just one step at a time. And truly, I feel like that is the attitude you need to have no matter what your goal is to achieve success. You have to have a big picture goal, of course, but you've got to be open to learning what path it takes you and focusing on your small short-term goals because that's more realistic and more attainable. So as I progressed in the sport and in this entire industry, I was fortunate to do very well. And that just ignited my passion to shoot for more. And of course, ended up um, you know, progressing as a pro athlete, making it to the Arnold Classic and Olympia stage, and eventually winning the world championship title once at the Arnold Fitness International and then two as Miss Fitness Olympia. Wow, that's that's awesome. So what what I heard one of the one of the things I heard you say, one thing that people could really take away is you you fell in love with the process. Correct. Yeah, you really fell in love with the actions and the process and you enjoyed what you're doing. Now now would you agree one of the biggest things I tell people who aren't in the best shape of their life or where they want to be is find the type of exercise you love doing and start there. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's no matter what the goal is, if you want to think big to the point where if you tell someone your goals and your dreams, they literally think you're crazy. And I say, that's when you know you're onto something, you know, shoot for the stars, but you have to be able to achieve it. And the best way to do that is by starting with something maybe you're familiar with, starting with something you love. And you got to take those initial baby steps to get started. Getting started is the hardest part. Then once you're enjoying it, you get hooked. You need a better challenge. You need a bigger challenge because now that's easy. So absolutely. If someone loves boxing, start with boxing. If someone loves yoga, start with yoga. If you love just going for a walk, enjoying nature and the fresh air, start there because that's what's going to lead you to success. Now, how intentional are your workouts? Do you set an intent for every training session? Do you set like some type of intent? Like today I'm going to really enjoy back training or I'm going to lift heavy or I'm going to hit a new P. It doesn't matter what it is, but you set a positive intent. How many of your workouts would you say you set a positive, especially when you're trying to achieve a goal like Olympia? Honestly, 90% have a very focused goal with each workout that I do each day. Now, there are some days that if your body's just kind of tired, but you just want to get moving for mental sanity, yeah. that's the times that I allow myself to just kind of almost float, for lack of a better word. I'm moving, but it's not at the intensity that are my other workouts. But absolutely, at this level, everything requires a strategy. You can't go in to being the best and being an elite athlete without a very focused strategy. So yes, if it's say back day, like you mentioned, it's not necessarily a broad general goal of I'm going to have the best workout ever. It's more specific. Like today, I'm really going to focus on engaging and activating my lower lats. That's an area of my body that I really want to develop before I step on stage again. And with each rep with each exercise my focus is on that specific body part or if it's say a hit circuit and it's explosiveness i focus on the energy getting through the workout you know you want to enjoy the process i try to with everything but when it's those hard intense workouts you have to set a goal whether it's the timing you know i want to finish this hit circuit in 26 minutes versus 28 when I did it two weeks ago. So there's very specific goals and maybe that's too aggressive. And it's like, okay, take it down a notch with me, go for 27. Don't try to jump too high, but I said it, I try for it. If I don't achieve it, I reassess for the next time. And for you, the listener hit circuit that Whitney's mentioned a few times is basically high intensity interval training. And so that's a period of high intensity explosive bouts max mixed with either active rest which means basically doing something easy for a short period of time or complete rest it just depends on the training so this would be doing a sprint in a very simple example doing a sprint for 30 seconds and then walking for 30 seconds and you can apply this to yeah. many different types of exercise now the things that i find really interesting between you whitney and the fittest 80 year old man in the world 
right? Entrepreneurial leader and speech coach, Joel Weldon, <laughs> we yeah. have on the podcast with us, is he sets intents for his workouts also. So we have the one of the fittest women in the world, Fitness Olympia, and then we have one of the fittest 80-year-old men in the world, Joel Weldon. <laughs> he sets intents, but it's different. His intents is, I'm going to go out with Skipper and Scout, his, his two awesome golden retrievers, and he's going to look for golf balls and he's going to connect with his dogs yeah. and he's going to have an amazing time. So he just focuses on, but he really does it's not, it's not like a little thing like, Oh, I'm going to enjoy. I'm very stressed. I'm going to no. He's like, mm -hmm. he fully gets his mind. I've seen him do. He fully gets his mind into that zone and it's totally intentional, but it's just happiness. So whether you want to yeah. develop your lower lats, cause you're trying to compete against the best physiques in the world, or you just want to have an amazing quality of life, setting that intent for exercise is absolutely freaking huge for keep mm -hmm. doing the thing. Because if you're a yeah. beginner and you start just doing like whatever workouts online that are available and you're kind of going through the motions, that's awesome. But if you just mm -hmm. do that, you're not going to keep doing it. But when you get intentional Correct. in yeah. the example of Joel, or you get intentional in the example of Fitness Olympia, Whitney, then you're going to follow through with it. But you got to find your own intent and whatever mixes with sure. you. Would you. And you always want to feel accomplished in your goal for that day. And the way to do that is to have a strategy, a plan laid out, because then you finish your workout and you don't think, did I really do that exercise and that exercise? Because your mind was elsewhere. You want to focus. Everyone talks about being present. You need to be present and intentional in your own workouts so that at the end of it, you can say, yeah, I really did what I wanted to do. I achieved what I wanted to do. And that way it helps you feel accomplished each and every day. So let's look at both men and women. And let's mm -hmm. look at that men want to, I'm sure, develop their shoulders, their chest, their arms, the, the, the um, not instinct, but almost uh, like evolutionary muscles that go, oh, this man can protect me, right? If we look at the baseline of why people want these things is he can be a good protector and provider of the family, for example. That's why those little bugs and thoughts get into our mind, right? And mm -hmm. then women, what do they want? They want a more developed butt, more developed legs, attractive legs. This is something that's in our culture is looked at as a very high a quality for the appearance of a female and then to have a thinner waist. And as you talked about, why do you want to develop your lower lats? Because it gives you more V shape, which then makes your waist look smaller, makes your butt stand out more. And it's very aesthetically appealing. And why is yeah. that from an evolutionary standpoint is because it looks as the females, um, capable of birthing children and and has and has great reproductive capability now i'm not being sexist i'm being evolutionary yeah. and all the scientists that look at this it's accurate <laughs> so with, with that funny note of why but how do the men and women who all want to achieve these kind of results what would you say because you develop some of the best not only yourself but others the best physiques in in the world and your trainers develop some of the best physiques in the world mm -hmm. So what are the things that people have to have in place in their workouts to get these type of results? What would you say that the types of routines and training to get like the amazing results you've had? Well, first and foremost, you have to know what you are trying to achieve. And you would be shocked at how many times meeting with clients, they don't have an idea of what they want. Besides, I want to look the best I can. Okay, but let's let's get down to details. Let's be specific. Just when you set a goal, you can't say, I want to be the richest person in the world. Okay, well, how are you going to get there? And, and what does that look like? So you truly have to break it down. Now, in our industry of competing, genetics play a major role. And you have to then assess, okay, what genetically do you have that's working great in your favor? What are some of your downfalls? And then we work on making your downfalls, some of your greatest attributes ever. And that is how you structure it. But knowing what you're going after, making sure they're in the right mindset and they're willing to put in the work, they want this goal, that's the biggest part. It goes back to mindset, like we said early on. You can achieve so much when your mind is right. So it's not just being a physical athlete, it's being a mental athlete. And honestly, at the level that we're at in this sport, I absolutely 100% will always stand by the people at the top are more of a mental athlete than a physical athlete. Mm -hmm. Early as you're beginning your journey in this, you are a 
physical athlete. You've got to take the time to create the physique. But at that point, it's really making sure you have the confidence to step on stage. It's really knowing that you're able to tap into your workouts and focus and be intentional in everything that you're doing. So it's a constant uh, assessment and a process with clients to go, okay, great. Say, for example, every six months, we reevaluate where they're at, sometimes sooner. And is your body developing and changing the way that we all set out to achieve? If not, what's going on? And let's take a step back and see why. As a coach doing this for a while, it's pretty easy to see what should be experienced. You know, in a six month period, if someone doesn't make changes, there's something wrong. And there could be a variety of factors contributing to that. But it's a constant assessment and reevaluation to change and modify your strategy so that we can reach the target goal on time. So it's tough, guys and girls, you guys have a lot easier um, aspects to develop certain body parts than females do, as you kind of outlined. And it's just a matter of really making sure everything is focused, strategic, and that you're paying attention to change things up so that your body is constantly challenged. You can't do the same workout for a year and expect these amazing results because your body will acclimate, you get too used to it, and it's not challenged in the way that it constantly needs to be challenged in order to be at your absolute best. So in terms of the do, like what should people do to be the race car at the end there, what I heard you say to continually challenge yourself. So really mm -hmm. it's, it's having more strength, right? In the beginning, you have to get stronger. If you want to develop a muscle, mm -hmm. you must get stronger. So if you don't, if you don't lift more weight on the muscle that you want to develop, then you're not, or you do more reps or you do it in a way that you don't sure. necessarily have to lift heavy. But from my sure. experience of developing bodies, you, you really, it, depending on how extreme you want to make that muscle result, there's the first mm -hmm. element is you must get stronger you and you must get actually a Absolutely. lot stronger if you want to develop a lot more muscle, right? But then there's mm -hmm. other strategies that you don't have to use as much weight. You can use shorter rest. You can use mid reps, like eight reps or 10 reps. And if you get stronger, at doing an eight or 10 rep set. And now you're lifting instead of 70 pounds, you're lifting 80 pounds, very likely that muscle is going to grow. So you have to use all these different strategies of changing rest, For sure. changing sets, changing reps, backing off some weeks, moving forward in some weeks. And how, how do you feel about uh, for physique athletes doing uh, undulation. So in other words, not every week, you don't just progress, progress, lift more, do more, do more, but actually having planned back off weeks where you actually let your body recover more. How do you feel about that? Absolutely. You always have to have the downtime. People don't realize the whole aspect of creating the physique happens a lot after the workout. So it's allowing your body to you know, recover. In a workout, you're breaking down all the muscle fibers. They need that time to repair. So if you're going full throttle all the time, your body never has that time to rest, recover, and do what it needs to in order to repair. So absolutely, um, you know, you need to build in rest, rest days each week. You can't train seven days a week. You have to have some rest days. Um, you know, like you said too, you can't be every single week, lifting hard, lifting heavy, being intense. You have to have some of those times. And I, I can tell you there's some weeks that it's like, okay, take all your, your weight down, do higher reps, focus on form, focus on a four count. You know, if you're doing say a shoulder press, four count up, four count down. So it's slow repetition, but it's just as challenging. So it's, it's changing up the workout again to keep it guessing, but also not having your body constantly in that stressed environment. And there's sometimes, you know, I'll tell clients, you're off the whole week and believe it or not, they kind of freak. What? You want me to not even go to the gym for a week? Yeah, absolutely. And their bodies just need it, you know, especially athletes that are competing at a high level and they're maybe doing multiple competitions having several days where you just relax mentally, physically, that almost allows your body to get in kind of that reset mode. And then you'll find that you have way more energy when you actually get back in the gym and you can push because you've had that time to relax, recover, and then have that desire to really hit it hard again. 
So yeah. what's interesting <laughs> with that, Whitney, is you're giving us a pro athlete level of how to get there, which if people model, they're going to start getting an appearance and function more towards a pro athlete. But then you have the, the more standard person that's going to have a lifestyle like Joel. So Joel mm -hmm. trains regularly. He has an awesome trainer that he works with multiple times a week, but then he goes to Powell for like, he's on the lake up to 90 days yeah. a year. So it's a I totally it. different shift and change to the type of training he's doing. And then he gets all these endurance results from doing slalom skiing and all the different types of activities and, and houseboat work and all the stuff he's doing, which is a type of physical training. And that's what sure. most people do is you can use kind of your active vacations as mm -hmm. this undulation period. So, you know, if you think about it like that, or you think about having going on vacation and then also hiking or biking or doing these different activities that might be different than what you're normally used to, you can plan in a fun lifestyle version yeah. of getting super fit like Whitney without actually having the extreme discipline and only being a, a gym focused person, how a lot of people would look at it, right? Absolutely. Absolutely agree. So well, listening to your knowledge and the depth of understanding that you have, and going back to what you said in the beginning, when Robbie was talking about the 16 injuries or surgeries, not injuries, yeah. the injuries were yeah. too many to count, the surgeries yeah. were 16. <laughs> so the question is, did these come from competing or from training? Because Robbie always says, what's the percentage that are going to get injured at the gym? 87% 87% exercise eventually get injured. Yeah, right. Well, I figured yeah. that while I was listening, uh, I've had probably 2176 sessions with Robbie and his trainers over the last 20 years, probably more. And then I figured if we had between 10 and 15 different exercises, mm -hmm. that's probably between 20 and 30,000 different exercises you've had me use and do. And I only had one hamstring pull one day when I was doing leg curls too fast. And that was the only thing in 20 years. So That's now amazing. what about you? Was your surgeries and injuries from competing or from training to compete? Great question. Um, I would say half of them because several of my injuries happened before I got into the sport. So that was just being honestly a little daredevil. Like I said, I had two older brothers and I don't have a lot of fear. I love new things. And so it's like, hey, do you know how to do a backflip? No, um, but show me, I'd love to try, you know, stuff <laughs> like that. Um, so I did sustain plenty of injuries, just kind of being a daredevil. But then as an athlete, as I got older in my adult years and then getting into this sport, Unfortunately, having broken bones, having had surgeries before I became a competitive athlete, that all played a role in creating additional injuries. Plus, we have to think back. We don't have the, no the knowledge that we have now is so different than what we had growing up. You even think about PE, PE in elementary school. You would stretch, stretch, and then they'd have us go do some crazy things. And the stretching was maybe 30 seconds, touch your toes, breathe deep. All right, let's go. And nowadays there's so much science behind properly warming up, properly cooling down, taking care of your body, getting body work done in between workouts. So there's a lot more information out there that we didn't have back then. So as a new athlete in this sport, 100%, there was no proper warm up. There was no proper warm down. So a lot of the injuries were all sustained in training, um, improper training. Now you learn from, you know, bad experiences and lessons. So I've learned a lot through the years with these injuries, but unfortunately, because I've had so many ailments and just, I have so much metal in my body <laughs> and scars, it does create additional injuries because of the position my body's in now. So even though I have the knowledge to warm up properly and, and, and do everything the right way, still sometimes in my sport, it's an extreme sport. I do experience some bad falls, you know, obviously like when I tore my ACL, I was trying this crazy new gainer one-footed swipe back flip. 
that had never been done. It was something I decided to create. So there was no instruction on how to do it properly. And unfortunately on competing at a high level, you have to raise the bar. And that comes with injuries sometimes. And I had had some issues with my glutes um, before trying that skill. So that week I probably shouldn't have been trying it, but I went for it and it resulted in an injury. But it's almost all, there's only been one injury I ever sustained during an actual competition. So I'm lucky about that, but it's all been through the process of training. So it, you had, well, you have one injury with picking up the, after pregnancy, picking up the baby carriage, right? You tore your rotator yes. cuff doing this. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And you know, it's amazing how many moms have had the same type injuries mm. because we get used to it. You know, you think, oh, I'm strong. I can pick up the baby. Well, the baby's growing. <laughs> the baby's getting heavier. You're not exactly advancing your strength at the rate the baby is growing. And we're always in a hurry. Think about moms, you're balancing 8 million things. So what happened was I reached back to lift it up. And, you know, again, it was a very awkward movement. I shouldn't have been doing that. I should have taken more time to properly lift and yeah, tore my rotator cuff. I mean, it was, it was not fun. That had nothing to do with training. That was just living my life as a mom. But amazingly enough, it does happen because you go back to what were you doing wrong? Well, I was rushing. I was hustling. I wasn't thinking. I wasn't focused on that movement. Injuries happen. So it doesn't even matter in training. It happens outside all the time if you're not intentional yeah and, and so what other injuries have you had in training um so i broke my neck that was probably the most severe injury Whoa. <laughs> yes, broke your yes. neck wow i broke yes i broke my neck actually three years ago and i came back into the sport that's actually when i won my first world championship title and then went on to win the additional two after that too. So my world championship titles were won after I broke my neck. And I love telling that story because everybody needs that source of inspiration or you know, you're know, you dealt with some bad things in life and how you handle that is what truly defines your character. And it's not easy to get yourself in that spot where you can go, I can do this, I can overcome it. But being able to relate to others is a lot of the reason why people go, okay, I'm not alone. I can do this. If you did this, it gives me hope that I can as well. So I love sharing that story saying, look, this is a crazy injury. I didn't know if I'd ever even be able to hug my children again because I lost full function of my right arm. Um, you know, the prospects from surgery were not looking good, but thankfully, it worked out. I put in a lot of work to come back and recover, but I never expected to be at the same level, much less better. But again, that's where mindset comes into play. You have to believe. And I put out everything in the universe to say, I will do everything I can. I know within my control, I can put in the effort mm -hmm. and I hope my body follows along. And fortunately, having that right mindset is what led me to be successful and be at the top level in this sport. Whitney, how did you break your neck? So um, we all love challenges, right? Um, I thought break dancing was very, very cool. And in my sport, I'd never seen a female step on stage and do any type of b-boy moves or break dancing. So it was like, well, let's try it. Never done this before. So YouTube is a great outlet, a great resource. I found inspiration and some ideas that I wanted to try there. So I had been mastering a head spin, <laughs> believe it or not, <laughs> me doing head spins and it, they were going great. But then I got a little aggressive and wanted to go faster. So I have a snowboard helmet, put my snowboard helmet on, on carpet so that I could spin faster. And I'd been doing this for about half an hour, but you know, you don't always land everything, obviously. And I kind of creaked my neck one time, fell really awkwardly. But the thing was in, in some injuries, and I do know this now, you can break your neck and not fully know it's broken. Well, that was my experience. I lost feeling in my arm. It went numb uh, over time, um, you know, within weeks, I lost full function of it where it literally would not move from my side. But I thought it was shoulder pain. Uh, I had no clue it was my neck that was the problem. I just 
thought, you know, I tore my shoulder up again. Well, in that week, when I had those crashes doing head spins, I was also trying some more backflips. And again, it was a different kind of cattywampus, very unconventional backflip. And I crashed several times doing the backflip too. So I was landing on my head and tweaking my neck in very awkward positions within a three-day period. So I don't know to this day which specific one broke it um, or if it was a culmination, a culmination of all those three days where it was just like, we're done. But that's the way it happened. So doing backflips and, and head spins was how I ended up breaking my neck and then realizing it after the fact that it wasn't in my shoulder. But nerve damage is a funny thing. And you feel it in other areas of your body that don't make you realize where the original issue is coming from. And that was my experience with it. So let's talk about two more injuries. What, what other two injuries did you have that might be possible for others to sustain, especially following a lot of these kind of intense training plans that are online that they're just um, following and is not necessarily right for them? Some, some correlation. What, what do you? Yeah. Well, coming back from my neck surgery, it was actually nine months. My goal was to get back on stage. So I'd set a goal. It was going to be nine months from my surgery. Four, and that's when my show was. It was the Arnold Classic 2018. Four weeks out from the show, I was feeling great. You know, obviously not at my best, but trying to just make it work with the body parts that I had that did work. Well, I was doing um, one of my fitness moves and landed completely wrong and tore my ACL and my MCL. So knee injuries are extremely common in athletes with people who are working out in the gym. And that can be a result of so many different things, lower back pain, hamstrings, glute tightness that can throw your knee off track. And that's why you see so many knee injuries. Again, not properly warming up, stuff like that. Well, since it was close to show when you're an athlete at my level, you are leaning down and your body just doesn't have the tissue or for lack of a, a better word, it doesn't have like the oil around the joint that it normally does because you're leaning down and getting in competition shape. So my body was extremely tight and I fell, um, crashed on one of my skills, tore my ACL and my MCL. So I actually went into the 2018 Arnold Classic, nine months post neck fusion and with a torn ACL and MCL. Uh, it was unconventional, but again, my goal was to provide hope to athletes so that they knew you can overcome anything. And I did not expect to win. Of course, I was thrilled with the outcome that they awarded me number one. Um, but it was because again, I had a I had one leg and I had two arms that didn't really work at the best of its ability. So I had to think out of the box and you always want to find a way. You got to overcome these obstacles. Whatever's thrown at you, there's always a way if you believe. I believed it. And I came up with a completely unconventional routine that used one good leg and my brain to make it entertaining and came out with more sass and energy than I've ever had before. And I came out on top, but that was probably the most epic experience because a neck injury, a blown ACL and MCL, um, ended up winning the championship title and then flew home the next day and had surgery. Wow. Which championship was that? So that was the 2018 Arnold Classic wow. Invitational. So that was Miss Fitness International. Wow, you won the Arnold Classic with all those injuries. That's amazing. <laughs> That's yes, amazing. It was wow. pretty crazy. But yes, again, I love it because it allows an opportunity for people to see that there is hope. There is always a way. Well, since you joined on video, you're going to get a treat to watch this very short but very intense workout. This is what she did. And as they say in Hollywood, let's roll it. Trip. It's getting all the brief 
Here's, here's what I'm seeing as, as, a, as a biomechanist and as a person who's spent five years with some other doctorate level sports medicine experts analyzing the biomechanics of the whole body head to toe and figuring out, you know, from a million different case studies, literally a meta analysis, figuring out what the movement of the human body should ideally be and where is injury most commonly caused and finding stats, for example, like in the NFL, for example, what percentage of injury do you think is non-contact in the rough, tough, brutal sport of NFL? Non-contact. That they, they're, they're getting injured by zero contact. I would say it's pretty high. My guess would be maybe 60, 65%. Yeah, exactly. And 67%. But oh, when most- Oh, wow. Yeah, when most people think about that, they would never guess that non-contact in, in the NFL. So only 33% of the time, these athletes are getting injured by contact in the NFL. Yeah. And yep. so the reason why, and the reason why you've also had those injuries is your body, when you train by specificity, gets stronger at doing that specific move. So you have two things that you're dealing with. One is specificity. So one is, what is your body adapted to doing in training? You have another very important and just as important, if not more important factor. And that factor is, what is your body ideally designed to do? For example, if you're doing plyometrics or jumping type of explosive exercise or running or sprinting or doing a lot of the types of moves that Whitney does and a lot of types of moves that you'll find in training plans online, is and, and in gyms and all over the place is when you're leaving the ground and coming back to the ground and even when you're not you're lifting heavy weight when you're doing lunging and squatting type of motions the hip and the knee should stay in line with the second and third toe so in other words from your hip all the way down to your foot whatever direction your foot's in that whole structure needs to be in a straight line again hip knee second and third toe all need to be in line and what happens is is that's not so easy to control when your knee falls in or falls outward and when that happens and the knee is a hinge joint it's only meant to open like a door to do one angle it's meant to do uh, the knee closes and the knee opens it's not meant to go to a side angle so what happens is when it goes into a side angle and this is a large part of the reasons why the injuries in nfl are so high is when you get that sheer stress or that sideways motion of the knee and it happens explosively or with a lot of load, this is what one area that causes injury. So that's one simple example that I can explain to you here on audio. But also there's the same type of mechanical function of the whole human body. So one is you have what are you adapted to? And we have some rules to help you listening to this podcast and how you can work with your body to get the best benefits and not the negative. So first, let's talk about specificity, how should you train for specificity? And now, Look, first of all, when I tell you that Whitney doesn't have the luxury of doing some of the things I'm sharing. And the reason why is because she's a high performance athlete. She can't just stay in a safe place. Otherwise, she's going to place like seventh, eighth, ninth, because you can't just stay in a safe place as an elite athlete. But the likelihood is you listening to this podcast 
you're not an elite athlete and that's not necessarily your goal to be the best in the world sure. at some specific sport. So one thing is just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. So just because sure. you, you go to the gym and let's say you're not used to working out or you are used to work regardless of where you're at, whatever your body is used to doing, you only need to progress up to about 10% more and you'll get a mm -hmm. great result if you can figure out how to keep making those incremental movements and then back off sure. once in a while. So almost every one of, of Whitney's injuries was not an incremental improvement. It, it, you know, it was, it was a Correct. big jump. She's, but she has to do that because she's an elite. She's like an NFL athlete. She can't, mm -hmm. you know, halfway run after the running back and try to, no, she has to like find the nth degree of effort to, to, get, to get there. But the funny thing and the interesting thing is, is that, well, it's not really funny when they get injured actually, but the interest, <laughs> interesting, not funny, is that people do that who don't really have the goal, like, like you do, Whitney, to become elite. So just because you can doesn't mean you should. And remember to progress. Absolutely agree you should only progress by about 10% and you should both have that progression and regression parameters. And in terms mm -hmm. of like the baby carriage thing is Whitney is reaching back. Her joint is in a long stretched out position, which puts the tissues in a position where the, the connection points of the muscle without giving you too much biomechanics, the connection points of the muscle aren't as attached. So they're not as strong mm -hmm. when you're reaching into a long position. And so you're more likely to get tears there. So remember in your workouts, yeah. if you're going into big, long positions, it better be an area you're very adapted to going into and very much adapted in the weight going into that position. And so that's a common way for injuries. And the other common way is just trying to progress um, too fast or just because you can. Remember, it doesn't mean you should. So th those are really two huge areas that I see that, you know, you, the listener can prevent, but taking everything Whitney said in terms of how she improved and, and then cutting that out because you're not trying to be fitness Olympia and Whitney is, that's the way you could get the most remarkable sure. results. Perfect. Okay. Um, yes, I absolutely agree. Granted, there's not everybody out there looking to be number one in the world, and that's absolutely fine. But everybody is shooting for a better quality of life, trying to live their best life. And, and it's not just about improving the exterior. A lot of people, I feel, relate going to the gym and having goals in the gym, relating it to just how you look on the outside, but there's so much value that can be gained mentally and seeing, you know, learning where your strengths and progressing and achieving all these small little goals you set. And granted, the benefit is looking good on the outside too, but you got to focus on improving yourself internally as well and taking the baby steps to get there, doing it strategically, doing everything with intention and focus and that's what's going to help you succeed in being the best version of yourself. Well, and you should have done that with your speaking too. I know since you've been competing and winning these championships, you've been on a lot of interviews uh, that we worked on mm -hmm. these podcasts. And, and that's the same yes, dedication you're amazing. that you put, put into your speaking as well as into your physical achievements. So congratulations on everything you've done and, and, how important that mindset is. You have that as your yeah. unique ability to always find the good, especially competing with a broken neck and all those yeah. things in the one-legged routine. So Robbie, let's wrap it up. <laughs> so you've heard from one of the fittest women in the world on how to have the mindset, first of all, to live a life that's successful regardless of what you're going after. But if you want to get in amazing shape, she's given, she's given you the tools and the resources and thought process to get there. And we've shared with you how to prevent injury so that you can keep moving forward and live your very best, <laughs> highest quality of life. Absolutely. This was amazing. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all and, and share my experience with everybody who's listening and Joel you are right you have helped me tremendously because I love sharing this story and, and connecting with others well make it a great day go to the ultimate you podcast.com 
When your mind and body are working in harmony, you develop the ultimate you. You think quicker and you feel good all the time. And when you're thinking quicker and feeling good all the time, you can express yourself even better and you're going to have the energy to achieve the things that you want. And as a result, you're going to make even more money. You'll have free tools that will help you do all of this and even more. Again, by just going to ultimateupodcast.com.